And we're continuing with the sixth chapter of Black Hearts and Battersea. Um, it's a long chapter, which is why I'm pausing at all of the pause points. The Twites talked to Simon at breakfast, determined that he probably did not go in the cellar, but uh, Mr. Twite did not seem to know anything about a sketch in Ditto's room, or in Dido's room. And we'll continue from there. That evening, Simon was washing out his shirt in a pail of water when Todd opened his door without knocking or remarked. Young Dido's calling for you, and Aunt Twite says, can you sit with her? Very well. Simon left his shirt soaking. Todd muttered, I can't think why she wants you. Oh, there you are, Mr. Thingamy, I declare, exclaimed Mrs. Twite, who looked, all, who looked flushed and irritable. I'm clean distracted with that child so feverish as she is. Keeps trying to get out of bed. Penelope, Penelope gone out to goodness knows where, and a meeting of the Glee Society in half an hour. She's been calling for you, dear boy, so if you could just sit there with her till she goes off. Of course I will, Simon said. He found Dido in a high fever, throwing herself restlessly about her bed, muttering random remarks, singing odd snatches of songs. When he took her hand, she quieted somewhat and lay back on the pillow. Hello, brat, said Simon. Do you want to play cards? Too hot, she muttered. Tell a story. Mrs. Twite put her head around the door long enough to nod a gracious approval and went quietly back to her Glee Society preparations. Simon racked his brains for a story. Then he hit on the notion of telling of his adventures during the years when he had lived in his cave in the forest of Willoughby Chase, playing hide-and-seek with the wolves all winter long. This answered famously. Dido let off, left off restless fidgeting and settled down, holding on to his finger, listening in languid content. I'd like to go there, she whispered. I expect you will some day. Her eyes opened in a drowsy flicker. Will you take me? Yes, very likely, if you are good and go to sleep now. Promise? Very well. She closed her eyes and she slept. Simon carefully withdrew his hand and tiptoed across the room to re-examine the little sketch, but it was gone. Annoyed at not having anticipated this and showed it to, to Mr. Twite in the morning, he tried to open the door but found it locked. Since he did not like to knock and risk w waking Dido, he found himself a prisoner, having searched the room for some occupation and rejected the chance of reading numerous copies of Maids, Wives, and Widows, and Maids, Wives, and Widows, and his Penny Magazine, he went philosophically to sleep, curled up on the floor. He woke to find Mr. Twite shaking him. So sorry, my dear boy. A most unfortunate oversight. My wife thought you had already retired. No doubt you will wish to do so directly. Thank you, said Simon, yawning. Then he recollected the sketch. Mr. Twite, that little drawing of Dido, the one that hung just there. No, no, my dear boy, no picture hung there. You imagined it, I dare say. Yes, yes. Your fancy is full of pictures, it is most natural. But I, but I saw. Ah, we artists, said Mr. Twite, waving him out of the door. Always at the mercy of our visions, by the way, he added in quite another tone. Have you seen my daughter Penelope by any chance? I'm afraid not, sir. Strange, most strange. Where can she have got to? Doubtless she will turn up, but it is vexatious. Ah, well, I'll keep you no longer from the arms of Morpheus. Dido was feverish for several days, and Simon sat with her each evening until she pronounced, was pronounced well enough to get up and lie outside on the patch of thistly grass by the river. "'I shan't be able to sit and tell you stories this evening,' said Simon, finding her so placed one morning as he went off. "'Why not?' "'Because I shan't be home till late.' "'Why, where are you going? To a circus?' Dido asked with instant suspicion. "'No, no. When I go to a circus, I'll take you too. I'm going to play chess with an old gentleman.' "'Stupid stuff,' said Dido, her interest waning. "'I wouldn't care to do so. Did you know Penny had run off? "'She left a note saying she wouldn't be put upon. "'You should have heard Ma create.' "'Simon recollected that he had not seen Penelope for several days. "'He could not feel any sense of loss at her departure. "'Perhaps Ma'll make some togs for me now,' Dido said, hopefully, "'echoing Simon's thought. Then she added, Where's your playing ch where are you playing chess, anyways? At Battersea Castle, Simon called over his shoulder as he walked off. Goodbye, brat, see you tomorrow. Mr. Cobb, Simon said that evening, as he mended the springs of a lady's per perch phaeton. 
What would you do if you thought you would discover a Hanoverian plot? Mr. Cobb lowered the wash leather with which he was polishing the panels and regarded Simon with a very shrewd expression. Me boy, he said, it's all Lombard Street to a China orange that I'd turn a blind eye and do nothing about it. Yes, yes, I know. Raising a quelling hand, I know the Hanoverians are a crew of fire-breathing traitors who want to turn good King James, bless him off the throne, and bring some flighty German boy. But I ask you, what do they actually do? Nothing. It's all a lot of talk and moonshine, harmless as a kettle on a guinea pig's tail. Why trouble about it when they, when they trouble nobody? Simon wondered whether Mr. Cobb would think them so harmless if he were to see the, the contents of the twice cellar. But, just as he was opening his mouth to speak of this, the Chelsea church clock boomed out the hour of nine, and he had to hurry off to Battersea Castle. He took the main way over Chelsea Bridge and through the great gates beyond it. A tree-bordered avenue led to the castle, which rose like some fabulous pink flower among the encircling gas flames. "'Who the devil are you, and where the devil do you think you're going?' growled a voice ahead of him. A burly man came out of a porter's lodge halfway along the avenue and halted Simon by pressing a button which caused two cross lances to rise out of the ground, barring the road. "'The Duke has invited me to play chess with him,' Simon said. "'Play chess? With a ragged young tiger like you, a likely story,' the gatekeeper sneered. As a matter of fact, it was a likely story, since the Duke made friends with all kinds of odd characters, and this man knew quite well. But he hoped to wring some gate money out of Simon. "'I'm not ragged, and the Duke's expecting me,' Simon said calmly. "'That man, please. Oh, no, I'm not so green as to let riff-raff and flash coves in to, ping, to prig whatever they can mill.' I'm not lowering that barricade for you, no, not if it w if you was to go down on your benders to me, not if you was to offer me so much as half a guinea. Simon remained silent, and the man said angrily, Not if you was to offer me a whole guinea, I wouldn't open it. I shan't do that. Simon said, Oh, and why not, my young shaver? Because you'll have to open it anyway. The Duchess's carriage is right is just behind you. The gatekeeper swung around with an oath. True enough, the carriage, which Simon had observed leaving the castle as he reached the lodge, was pulling up smoothly just behind the man, and the coachman was crying impatiently, "'Jump to it there, daggett! Do you think her grace wants to wait all night?' Red with suppressed emotion, daggett hastened to obey. Sophie, who was sitting in the carriage opposite her grace, holding a reticule, a telescope, and a mahjong set, dimpled a smile at Simon, and the duchess inquired, is that your young friend, Sophie? He looks a very personable lad. Yes, ma'am, said Sophie. The Duchess addressed Simon. So you're the young man who is kindly coming to play chess with William and keep him amused while I go to the opera. It is very obliging of you. William detests opera, and I only find it tolerable to pl if I play mahjong with Sophie while the, sitting, while the singing is going on. But of course one has one's box and must attend regularly. "'I hope you had a, you have a pleasant evening, ma'am,' Simon said politely. "'Thank you, my dear boy. We shall meet again, I trust, a delightful face.' The Duchess went on, speaking to Sophie as the carriage rolled away. "'You have excellent taste, Sophie, dear.' "'Thank you, Your Grace.' The main entrance to the castle lay up a treacherous flight of curving steps. At the top stood two haughty bewigged footmen in cream and gold livery and rose-colored buttons. "'Good evening,' Simon said civilly. I've come to play chess with the Duke. Evidently they had been told to expect him. One of them led him through a lofty hall, up another flight of stairs, and across a great black and white tiled anteroom to a pair of doors which he threw open, announcing, The young person, your grace! The room Simon entered was a large library with fireplaces on either side. The Duke jumped from a chair by one fireside and came hurrying forward. He was elegantly dressed tonight in satin knee breeches and a velvet jacket but still looked absent-minded and untidy. The old-fashioned wig he wore was twisted askew. So was his cravat, and one of his velvet cuffs was covered in ash. "'Ah, this is a pleasure!' he exclaimed. "'I have been greatly looking forward to our game!' He bustled about, pulling forward a comfortable chair and ringing several bells. "'You'll take a little something?' he inquired. "'Black currant brandy? Prune wine? Scrimshaw? Bring the chest set!' 
Jab wing, prune wine, and biscuits. The Duke's chest set was very beautiful. The pieces were of greenish glass. Cunningly twisted and carved, the Duke set them out lovingly on a leather board, polishing each one on his cravat. The white men were clear right through, and the black were veined with streaks of dark glass. They began to play, and it did not take Simon long to discover that his grace was not a very good player. He tended to start well with some bold moves, but then his attention would wander. He would jump up hastily to search for a quotation in a book or to examine a patch of lichen on one of the burning logs on the hearth. "'You play very well, my boy,' the Duke said after Simon had won two out of the three games. "'Who taught you?' "'A friend of mine, sir,' Simon said, sighing. Uh, "'Dr. Gabriel Field.' The Duke's face lit up. "'Ah, oh, Dr. Field! He is an excellent player, is he not? And a dear fellow. Where is the good doctor? I have not seen him in ages.' "'You know Dr. Field?' Simon gazed at him in astonishment. "'Why, yes, I met him at the Academy of Art.' Riviere's I learn painting. Oh, you learn painting, do you, my boy? I am not surprised to hear it, for you have the face of an artist. Yes, I met Dr. Field at Rivers. I am one of the patrons, you know. Marius Rivers was married to my aunt. I often drop in at the academy. The good doctor and I have many interests in common. He has advised me on several pieces of scientific research and helps clean my pictures. Clean pictures, your grace? Simon was momentarily puzzled. Family pictures, old masters that have been darkened with age. Simon nodded. Dr. Field had given him some instruction on the processes of picture cleaning on his last visit. Indeed, the Duke went on. I wish he would return, for he was halfway through cleaning Riviere's famous painting of a wolf hunt, and I long to have it completed. See, I will show you. He led the way to the far end of the library, a good hundred year yards off. Here, he turned, blowing a shrill blast on a small golden whistle. One of the footmen came running from the door. Jab wing! Light some more tap tapers, please, and then bring my gruel. Soon, half a hundred candles had been kindled.